Do loopholes in the U.S. immigration system encourage illegal immigration and human trafficking? How do these loopholes make children especially vulnerable, and are activist judges preventing meaningful change to the system? And what could President Donald Trump do to affect change? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellek. Today we sit down with attorney Sidney Powell, who has been lead counsel in more than 500 appeals in the Fifth Circuit. She is ranked by her peers as a Texas super lawyer and is also the author of License to Lie, Exposing Corruption in the Department of Justice. Very, very good to have you. President Trump has described the poorest southern border that we have as a humanitarian crisis, as a natural crisis. Um, you have some personal experience, from what I understand, uh, with illegal immigration from years back. Can you flesh that out a little for us, please? Yes, definitely. I was a federal prosecutor in the Western District of Texas. We had more than 600 miles of border in the Western District of Texas alone. We saw all manner and means of crime coming across that border on a daily basis was absolutely astounding. And this was uh, several decades ago now. It's only gotten worse. It's beyond capacity for the Border Patrol to handle it at this point. And we absolutely must have the fence and barricade that the President has talked about. I mean, it's made a huge difference in El Paso where there's fencing. It's made a huge difference in San Diego where there's fencing and it protects the Border Patrol agents themselves from immediate and direct contact except when they're prepared to have it. So your personal experience was that where, where this fencing or wall existed, there was a reduction in crime? Oh, definitely, yes. There's much greater security where there is a fence and it gives the Border Patrol agents a chance to prepare for whatever it is they need to deal with and controls and funnels the traffic to where they can deal with it. I'm going to jump to the main topic for today, which is loopholes in the immigration system. We want to kind of, you know, get a little bit of your thoughts on, on, on these areas. Um, it's generally agreed that there are many that basically allow for, um, it, to some extent, unchecked illegal immigration. What, what are your thoughts on what the b biggest of these loopholes are? Well, there's several huge loopholes. One is the asylum provision that lets people just make blanket claims of needs for asylum. And of course, Attorney General Sessions tried to set forth some uh, more reasonable standards for that, which is completely within his discretion to do under the law. But a district court judge has already tried to set that aside and cause problems for the administration in enforcing that, even though, as I said, it was within Attorney General Sessions' discretion to do that. So that's in litigation now. And then also there's the whole issue of uh, human trafficking, which is an absolute abomination. It's just, human trafficking is the fastest growing offense in the country. And it's affecting our children as well as children brought here from other countries. But it's become a loophole in the immigration laws because of the way the statute is written and the protections that it affords. And it's actually become, the, the way it's enforced has become a means of encouraging human trafficking as opposed to discouraging it. Wow, so can you unpackage that a little bit? How does that law work, that it actually encourages human trafficking? Yes, because children that are brought here uh, unaccompanied are uh, now protected under our system as being human trafficked, but that means that more and more are brought here. So they're actually, it's actually encouraging people to bring them here and abandon them. And it's the drug cartels that are literally making billions of dollars every year from doing that. And everybody knows that the children are raped and sexually abused along the way. Mothers are literally giving their children birth control pills for the trip. It's horrid. It, it's just beyond comprehension of people who don't uh, deal with and have anything to do with that world. So I understand that if you're not from Mexico or Canada, like basically aside the U.S. border, um, and you arrive as an unaccompanied minor, they're not actually not allowed to send you back. Can you tell us me a bit more about this? I don't, I don't get that. Uh, it makes no sense at all. We have to be able to return uh, children to their parents in their countries. 
and we simply cannot become the orphanage for the world, nor can we continue to allow this human trafficking operation to flourish the way it is. We're simply feeding the drug cartels billions of dollars a year by doing it. There's also a provision uh, when it comes to uh, family units. Actually, from what I understand, there's record numbers of family units coming across the border in 2018. And there's also uh, a provision that uh, authorities can't detain children and families for more than 20 days during, let's say, an asylum uh, uh, application. Um, and that makes it difficult to actually adjudicate whether these people deserve asylum or not, and then they're let into the country. But only a very small number of these asylum claims, I think it's something like 9%, are actually deemed as uh, worthy. Um, how does that work? The lawyers are going south of the border and encouraging people to make these asylum claims. They're giving them the key words to use to uh, trigger the asylum provisions when they're completely fraudulent asylum claims. And that kicks into the protections of the statute that's too overly broad in the first place. And as I said, Attorney General Sessions was trying to put some constraints on that. That's been shot down wrongly. But we've just got to go back to tightening up those provisions because, as you said, more than 90% of the asylum claims are fraudulent. And those aren't being prosecuted either. You know how now in, our, in Robert Mueller's investigation, any kind of false statement to anybody is being prosecuted as a federal felony. Well, all of these thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of fraudulent asylum claims are the same kind of false statement that supposedly Roger Stone made and none of them are being prosecuted. You, you mentioned a judge uh, kind of blocking uh, the attempt that Jeff Sessions meant at rolling back the protections and so forth. From what I understand, there's been, or just in uh, President Trump's first year of office, there's been over 20 uh, nationwide injunctions from you know, what people are calling activist judges and so forth. Um, and many of them uh, relate to immigration policies. In the, to, to frame that, in the past, it was about 2.5 of these per year on average in previous administrations. What's your opinion of these injunctions? It's all part of the resist movement. Uh, I mean, the left has just gone ballistic in filing and using the court system against this president in every way, shape, or form. And they've gone forum shopping to get these judges to make these rulings. The national injunction is unprecedented prior to the past few years. There should be no such thing as a national injunction. It makes no sense. Justice Thomas wrote a concurring decision, I think, in one of the recent cases talking about that because it takes away the authority of the other circuit and district courts. A district judge's jurisdiction doesn't extend beyond his own district. So how they are making these national edicts, as I said in, in, on one other show, they're not kings. You know, if they could make a ruling for the entire nation, they'd be called kings. And they're not. So <laughs> we've just got to stop that too. Department of Justice can do a lot more on fighting that. Well, yeah, so I, I don't understand. I think many of our viewers won't understand. Let, let's say that uh, you know, a regional judge basically makes a national uh, ruling. How does that prevent, say, the executive order which the judge ruled against from actually still being in effect? I, I don't understand that exactly. Well, they just enter an order that says this applies across the country. But if I were the executive or in the Department of Justice, I would say, I'm not applying this beyond your district. And I would let it be litigated in other districts. Because one of the things that happens before the Supreme Court takes a case is you have what's called a split in the circuits because cases go up in other circuits. Mm -hmm. And often other circuits decide things different ways. And usually the Supreme Court won't even take a case until there's what's called a deep split in the circuits, like several circuit courts have ruled one way on it and several other circuit courts have ruled the other way, and then the Supreme Court will decide it. Well, the way these national edicts worked by these king judges uh, th there would never be a split in the circuits because one judge decides something for the whole country. One district judge, the lowest level federal judge there is. It's absurd. Let's call it a battle around immigration reform and border security is actually shifting into the judiciary. 
Um, what do you expect to see in 2019? More of the same. Just resist, 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 which is not a healthy way for the country to function at all. I mean, the president was vested with these powers for a reason. Courts cannot decide immigration policy. There's a provision in the United States Code that gives the president the absolute authority to stop all immigration if that's what he decides is in the national interest. He can do that. In fact, I've got an article on the Daily Caller called The President Has the Power to Stop All Immigration. Invaders, immigrants, he can stop it all. And I've, I would encourage him to use that authority and do it until we get the whole thing sorted out. There's a number of caravans, as we've been hearing in the news, you know, coming up to America right now. What do you think is, you know, we've discussed a number of, uh, of different areas, but what do you think is the major contributing factor to basically the formation of these caravans and this kind of repeated uh, method of, of oh, approaching the U.S. being used? They're obviously an organized and funded effort. They're being given buses to come here. Uh, there are food trucks and supplies along the way. Uh, it's probably, you know, Mr. Soros and his assorted organizations funding it. Alinsky-type tactics to overrun and tax all of our resources. And the real problem that people don't understand is that while Border Patrol resources are being diverted to take, literally take care of children and get them to hospitals and make sure they're being taken care of as best we can, they're either Trojan horses or diversionary tactics and real problems are coming in where people are not looking. Oh, I see. You're saying the, the illegal, uh, the, the criminals or so forth, they're basically using the people that are, you know, want to come across as immigrants uh, as a diversion? Yes, diversions and Trojan horses. How does the Trojan horse thing work? Well, for one thing, people smuggle drugs in in their bodies. Mm. Yes. Uh, people don't realize that, but oftentimes the drug cartels are so evil they will make people swallow drugs in balloons and then get them out on the other side. There have been cases where drugs have been implanted in people's bodies surgically and then removed on the other side. I mean, there are all kinds of manners and means of, of using people as human mules, they call them, to bring drugs in knowingly or unknowingly and oftentimes the cartels will hold one of their family members hostage or something on the other side of the border until they get the drugs on this side, and then it just, the cycle just repeats. What can the Supreme Court do in this sort of situation? There's a number of these cases that are now kind of coming up through the court system. Presumably they'll all eventually get to the Supreme Court. Can we expect to see that in 2019? and some rulings from at that level? Oh, I would hope so. I would hope the Supreme Court recognizes the power of the president and the attorney general to deal with these issues under the law as it's written, because that's what it is. That's the way it is written. It's very startling, in a sense, to, to hear all this framed this way. Um, actually, there's also a backlog of something like 800,000 cases in the immigration system as we speak, which is kind of really weighing down the system. So yes, that's why I think the president should simply stop absolutely all immigration except for the non-immigrant visas. You know, there are multiple different kinds of immigration. There are immigrant visas where people are actually going to come here and stay. And then there are non-immigrant visas for like students and um, work, you know, people that are going to come here and work for a little bit and go back or whatever. So there are different kinds of visas, but all immigration should be stopped, I believe, until we get all of this sorted out, the backlog gone, the fence built, a rational and reasonable immigration system in place. And that would give the backlog time to clear, time for new laws to be in place so that we could have some sort of reasoned basis for pursuing and continuing an immigration policy. Because right now it is one mel of a hess. How long would something like this take, would you imagine, uh, to actually sort things out? Well, if everything were absolutely stopped, I think it would get done sooner rather than later. I think that would be a big incentive for the Democrats to come to the table and fix it. Because, you know, this is one of the things that you don't often hear. The president's obviously very pro-immigration, just 
the, the right kind. Right. Right. So. And most of America is. I mean, we love our lawful immigrants. They have contributed enormously to our society. Most of us wouldn't be here at all were it not for lawful immigrants. Is there any uh, anything else that uh, you think is important to share with our viewers around this issue? Just to en encourage and support the president in his efforts to straighten all of this out. Sometimes I feel like he is just so alone in his uh, efforts to get it all worked out and to get the wall built and do what he knows needs to be done to protect the country. And it is a matter of national security. It truly is. I can't emphasize that strongly enough. People do not realize what all is and can come across that border whenever it wants to. I mean, we're, we're that far away from having suicide bombers in this country. It's simply a miracle that we haven't had any already. Well, I guess it's a testament to the hardworking law enforcement folks down it, there. It is. To ICE and to our Border Patrol and to Homeland Security. Thank you very much, Sydney. Thank you. I really you. appreciate it. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Good to be with you. Mm -hmm.